everyone, I'm Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Animal Sanctuary. Welcome to Serpente Sunday for September 18th, 2022. Did you know that I'm a matchmaker? No, not really, but I do try to guide people when they're choosing a new animal family member and help them make just the right choice for an animal that's gonna suit their lifestyle and fit their expectations of that animal when it gets home to live with their family. And I've been doing that quite a bit lately with snakes. One of the people that I recently helped pick out a snake agreed to be interviewed and I'm very excited to share this very special episode of Serpente Sundays with you. We're gonna talk with Danielle Anise about the journey that she went through to pick out just the right snake that would fit into her family. Hello, Danielle. Thanks for joining me this evening and for staying up so late to accommodate my time and the snake's time. Well, thank you for having me, Lori. Well, you know me, I am a night owl, so. <laughs> I know. I do a process with lots of clients and some of my patrons to help them add new snakes to their family. And sometimes that's a very formal process that they actually solicit me to do with them. And that's not really how it worked with you. You were already a patron and I was coaching you on some snake training and behavior. And you mentioned to me that you had put a deposit on a third snake. And I said, oh my goodness, that's exciting. What kind is it? And you told me what kind it was. And I have that species here it's actually one of the very first species I ever started working with so I'm very familiar with them I have four of them I've had them over four years and I said well what are your plans with the snake what are your expectations for the snake what are your what does your ideal life look like with this new snake and and why you know are you getting it and you had mentioned to me I looked at my notes <laughs> that you wanted a snake that was more active, more visible, and more interactive than your royal pythons because you already had two royal pythons and that you were really excited because you wanted to do target training with the new snake and you wanted to do puzzle exercises and foraging exercises with it and that you really wanted a snake because you're an artist that iridesced, that really looked beautiful in the light. And I'm thinking of the species you chose and your list of criteria and only one of those things in my <laughs> mind and what I know about behavior matched the criteria that you wanted. And so I had just mentioned that to you. We talked informally. I mentioned some other species that might be better suited for what your expectations of the snake were because we can't make the snake something it's not. Right. Right. We can draw some behavior out of most species, but we can't turn it completely into something that is just not in its nature to be. And so we had a discussion. And what I would like to do is just go over that with you from your point of view. And then you have a new snake now. And I want to know how the process was helpful to you, how that worked out, and if you're happy with the snake that you ultimately got. And if you have any regrets about not getting the snake you originally thought you wanted. I'm absolutely so grateful for the conversation that we had. And it was really just a little bit over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we mention the species that I was thinking of? I'm okay with it because I like the species. I have four of them. However, honestly, it doesn't fit the criteria that you listed. It, it, it would not have fit your expectations other than in the one category. And so I think it's fine to mention it. I don't want to dissuade anyone from getting the species if that's what they really want. But I also want them to acquire the species with their eyes wide open and understand that you can't make it into something that it isn't. Right. And I think the importance of that, too, is like, is, I mean, aesthetics are important to a degree, you know, depending on the person and what your preference is, but the other aspects and reasonings for having, you know, this animal, I think far outweighs that. And it's not like you can't get a beautiful snake in another species either. So I think really being honest with yourself and knowing, you know, what is going to kind of fulfill you with this, you know, with this snake. I mean, you're going to have this animal for 30 plus years. So you want to be happy with it. You don't want to have expectations on it that you, 
you know, that it just can't meet and then, and then you're disappointed. So, um, yeah, so I called Lori and we had this great conversation and she really opened my eyes up to, you know, what, you know, what this criteria was that I was looking for and what I ended up. So I guess what I started thinking I wanted was a Brazilian rainbow boa because I just love their pattern. I love the iridescence. Um, I like their size, like they weren't too, too big. Um, it was going to be a, a very different, um, snake than my royal pythons um you know just i think even being a boa versus a python is a difference so i had spoken to lori about this and like i said she just made me really think it through and i had done a lot of um you know research into into that species but when we had our conversation it was pretty clear pretty quickly that a dwarf reticulated python like really hit every um you know aspect of what i'm looking for in in a snake and it wasn't something that i would have thought of because i you know thought they got so big like i didn't realize i was always thinking of the mainland reticulated pythons that you know get huge so I didn't even under like know like oh my gosh the, the dwarfs the super dwarfs you know you can get that same those same characteristics in a smaller package. And so and, I want to ask you real quick before we get go down that road when we <laughs> when you were still talking about the rainbow boas you didn't want a really small snake but you didn't want a really big snake so you were looking for a medium sized snake correct? Yes, yes, like six feet you know something around that you know. Bigger is a little worrisome, but, uh, you know, but I certainly didn't want a 20 foot snake, but I didn't want a tiny little, like, you know, two foot snake either. So I wanted size something was a factor and the look was a factor, but then most of your list, other than those two things were behavioral. And when you did your research into Brazilian rainbow boas, how much behavioral information were you able to find? You know, the main things that stood out to me was how, like, as you know, babies, they are very bitey and kind of, um, you know, not, not really necessarily handleable. And I, you know, it's hard because I, I, I guess after that conversation with you, because I did want to do target training, I did want to do choice-based interaction. And I certainly hadn't read, you know, or listened to interviews or videos on that aspect. So I don't know why I, I didn't open my eyes up enough <laughs> to to that behavioral aspect. Because I, I guess you all are also thinking, oh, well, it will be different, you know, maybe with mine. Um, <laughs> somehow, you know, again, you can't make something what it's not, you know, and I think you've got to, again, you've got to really consider that when making, you know, a decision like this. So you had a list of behavioral criteria. From my perspective, most of your criteria were behavioral things. They were, I want it to be visible and active, and I want it to be interactive, and I want to be able to hold it some, but that's not something I want to do all the time. You said, I'm very interested in tar target training it and doing foraging exercises and puzzle feeding exercises and activities with it. And I knew from my experience with my four rainbow boas, two Brazilians and two Colombians, how they are, that they are on the shy side. They tend to not be seen that much. They like to bury themselves and hide. And I see mine about once a month. I usually start seeing mine when they get hungry and they come out and they are target trained and they do shifting behaviors and things. But I pretty much only see them about once a month, maybe every three weeks. And it's usually when they get hungry and they have the urge to come out and hunt for food. And so I was really worried that you would end up with this snake that you would never see. It would be in a big elaborate enclosure and you would never see it. And it wouldn't meet any of your expectations other than how it looked on the rare occasion that it came out and you saw it. Because one of the things you told me was very important is that you wanted to raise this snake with all choice-based interactions. 
Yeah. You didn't want to use intrusive methods and you didn't, you wanted to raise the snake and have a life with the snake that was choice rich. And that is possible with rainbow boas. I do it with mine, but when you do that, they choose to not be seen most of the time. <laughs> and so I was very worried <laughs> that you would get the snake and be completely dissatisfied with it through no fault of its own. Yeah. And so we yeah. did... I made a list of species that would likely fit your criteria, which is what I do for everybody based on what I know about their behavior and temperament. And we came up with Brettles pythons, carpet pythons, the super dwarf retics. I think we mentioned bull snakes and indigo snakes. I think we also yeah. mentioned a couple of other species of boas, maybe like the Central American boas. I know we talked about a lot of species, but the one that really fit every tick mark that you had, that we checked every box on your list, which included the iridescence, because <laughs> that was important to you. You're an artist and and that visual part of the world is important to you. And so yeah. it came to the super dwarf retic that met the iridescence as well as all the behavioral things. And you were only kind of concerned about the size. So talk to me about... All of the species we sort of talked about and what drew you to the super dwarf retic or the dwarf retic? I mean, well, part of it was, you know, watching your videos with TC at the time and just hearing about just how much enjoyment you had with him. And then plus another, a couple other people that I, you know, know that had, um, have super dwarfs. Although I did end up with a dwarf <laughs> and cause he like beyond hit the criteria with his iridescence and his look and the fact that he came in a smaller package was an absolute he's, bonus. But he's a motley golden child. So he doesn't have um, a pattern really. He's got a little pattern on his head, but his body is just, you know, when the light hits him right, he's, he's just all iridescence and it's, it's quite spectacular. <laughs> I think the other, I'm trying to think, I, I, with the other snakes that we talked about, I really like the look of a python or a boa. We talked about some of the medium-sized colubrids or the little bit bigger colubrids like the bull snake or an indigo snake. I think we might have, of course, probably mentioned corn snakes, but they they weren't exactly what you were looking for either because you said that you would like to let it be able to roam around while you worked. And pythons and boas definitely are more suited to that than a colubrid, which is can be darty and quick and get away from you before you know it. We ended up back with the pythons and some yeah. of the characteristics of the pythons that are very visible and active and great at training um, don't iridesce and they aren't quite as friendly as a super dwarf. I think that you you had mentioned that you wanted to do some handling. You wanted to handle it some. And although some of my bridles pythons are really suit my needs I don't handle them a lot and they're not a snake that's just going to hang out with you they they like to roam around and do their own thing and I think that's another thing that brought us back to the super dwarfs because they tend to actually be friendly and curious about people well and I think and also I wanted one that you know when I got to that point where it was you know with, with the choice based handling that I did that it wouldn't be stressed out like I didn't want that you know for for my snake so, and, and like you said, I think the Bradleys weren't as quote unquote friendly, you know, as the super dwarfs are. And, you know, the, again, that's important to me. It's not, I don't have like 10, 20 snakes to choose from, to have, to interact with. So, you know, that, that's, that was really important for me, you know, and if I have friends or, you know, family come over and if they're going to interact with my snake I would like it. I prefer it to be friendly than you know than to fight anybody well it's it's really a, a complicated you know situation because you can certainly raise a dwarf retech or a super dwarf and it probably could have you know more behavioral issues based on how you know, you raise it up. So it doesn't mean you can't, you're never going to have a super dwarf or a dwarf that's not going to be bitey or that you're not going right. to be comfortable around. It really just depends on that relationship that you've built with it. And I mean, I feel that what I've done with him and I was very patient. Really want to emphasize the process, what you thought of the process. Okay. Um, if you have any regrets about not getting the okay. snake you originally wanted, 
And then, yeah, I want to get into how, if you're happy with the, the ultimate choice that you made, I want to know that and what about that choice makes you happy? What about that snake is working out for you? Is he still checking all those boxes for you? Um, I have no regrets um, getting my dwarf. His name is Aurelius. And he has like exceeded my expectations. He made me work a little harder than I think some other people with their super dwarfs. <laughs> he wasn't as keen to be touched and handled when I got him at all. So when um, I got him, he wasn't uh, quite as outgoing, you know, in a sense that I, that I anticipated, but I was determined to be patient. I was not going to push him in any way. I wanted to do choice based. So it was his decision to want to come out and and really slowly acclimate him to being touched because it was a bit aversive to him for whatever reason. So I was really proud of myself because I took months. I mean, it really was, oh gosh, I would say at least six months, maybe even more, maybe seven months. So I actually like literally held him. Once he got confident, like he very slowly you know, would just rest his head on the threshold of the enclosure and then he would come out and then he would come out more and then he'd entirely come out and then put himself back. And, and so it was a slow progression, but once he built his confidence and was like, okay, I, I'm now really curious. It, it was like a, a switch went off and it was like one day he was one thing, the next day he was a totally, his behavior completely changed. And it was like really fascinating to watch and you know and I think that has made him like just super confident because I didn't push it at all with him like I had that relationship and that interaction with him on his terms not on my terms. Is he more active visible and interactive than the royals that you already had? Yeah I mean I also I started target training him the very first time I fed him and I got him, he was four months old when I got him. So that aspect, he was like right off the bat. He was into it. He was smart. He progressed pretty quickly. And, you know, that was really um, rewarding for me because my royals aren't super food motivated. One of them does target training, but not as consistently. And the other one is kind of, you know not it's not really his thing yeah. <laughs> I do puzzle feeding with him is Aurelius um, also doing foraging and puzzle feeding does he come out and roam I mean how often would you say you see him I see him basically every night unless he's in shed so now that he kind of crossed over that threshold of like oh I'm out and about I, I really want to see the world he is at the door like every night I open it he comes out, he's out tonight right now, hanging out. And the the Royals I do see, and I have one of mine, Voltaire comes out a lot, but I don't see him as much as Aurelius. I mean, I've seen Aurelius out during the day, you know, not every day, but quite a lot. He's out way earlier at night. Sometimes he's out at like four or five o'clock at night. Sometimes he's actually come out around that time. And he's just, I don't, they're, they're just amazing animals. They just have this level of intelligence and, you know, there's, there's like a level of respect, I think, that you have for them that's different than the royals. Of course, I don't have any other snake species to compare it to. So but the desires that you had about sharing your life with the third snake, I feel like he's meeting. I'm hearing from you that he's meeting those expectations that you had and that you're not disappointed or feeling left unfulfilled with your life with him. Is that, would that be accurate? Oh yeah, that's absolutely accurate. I mean, he's, he's just a joy to have. I get entertained watching him, you know, move around. He, he's now at the point where he will crawl up on top of my head and like, likes to get up really high and check out, you know, the room or wherever in his, first enclosure that he you know is a smaller enclosure he would put himself back but now in this big one he's out and about he's 
he's like, no, he doesn't want to put himself back. <laughs> so I pretty much pick him up every time. And he's, it's just, it is really a cool process of seeing how they respond to even be picked up over time. Like, Cause initially, like if I just touched him, he would like flinch and flee. And now it's like, he's totally relaxed when I go to pick him up. Yeah. And usually now like I'll pick him up and he starts to want immediately to kind of crawl all over me. Which again, that was a buildup before I just pick them up and, you know, we go to point from point A to point B. So, I, I mean, I, I also with him, I just think about the future too. Like what is our relationship going to be like a year from now and two years, you know, from now. So do you have any regrets about not getting the rainbow boa or do you ever think, oh, I wonder what life with that rainbow boa would have been like, or you're just satisfied with how this turned out? Well, I definitely would not like to imagine my life without Aurelius in it. Rainbow Boa, you know, it's, it's, I, again, they're beautiful. I don't know if I'll ever get another snake, but even if then, like going through the criteria and everything we're talking about, I, I kind of know in my heart that that would also not be one that I probably should get. I mean, I love doing these beautiful enclosures, but I don't want to be just sitting and looking at plants all the time. Like I would like to see my snake and I don't, I want them to want to come out and like check things out and, and exploring. And I, I, for me, that is more enjoyable than holding them and having them crawl all over me. So the fact that they have that interest and and I love, you know, it's his idea. You know, he's at the door. He's like, let me out. I want to go out. I want to go check things out. And even if he comes out and he just wants to chill for, you know, two hours, it's, you know, that's that was his decision to do. So I think if I had, according to how your, you know, your rainbow bows are, if that only happened once a month, I think I would be pretty disappointed. You know, I want a different level. And, and I do feel like I've seen in the, in some of the rainbow boa groups, like they, I don't see a lot of them doing choice-based handling. So they are, you know, holding their snakes and bringing them out, but it's, you know, it's because that's what they want to do. It's not because what the snake wants to do. If you got a fourth snake, would you go through the same process again before you made a decision on what you were going to get? Yeah, I, I believe I would. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think too with the, with my, with my dwarf, it's, it seems like it's always a journey. Like there's always new things to learn and kind of discover about each other. I mainly <laughs> wanted to find out from you if you thought this process that I went through with you was helpful and if you have any regrets about doing it and how it worked out for you. If somebody came to you, let's say a friend comes to you and said, oh, I'm going to get a snake and I'm getting this one because I like how it looks, you know, or I'm getting this species because my friend has it. What, what would be your advice to them? Do you think that's a good idea just to say, oh, I love the way that snake looks or my friend has that snake. I want to get the same one. Yeah, I would definitely ask them to list, you know, whatever they're looking to you know, get out of that relationship with that snake. I would absolutely approach it differently than, and even other reptiles. I mean, I don't know a lot about other ones. I do have gargoyle geckos. Yeah. I mean, again, you're going to have this animal for 30, 35 years. And if you have these expectations that, 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 you know, the snake can't fulfill, you know, that's where people end up rehoming their animals. And that's not, you know, that's not fair to the animals, not fair to you. So I would go through, I would ask them the questions that you, you ask, like, you know, what do you want to do? How interactive do you want it? You know, this, this animal to be with you again, not everybody maybe wants to do training. Yeah. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I think about it like with somebody when they're, you know, they're in a relationship and they're not sure if they want to like stay in it or leave in it. And it's, you know, you write a list of, you know, the pluses and the minuses, <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds um, like that you want to stay in your relationship with your dwarf retic. And I'm happy about that since I felt a little bad about having you completely change your mind from the snake that you had actually put a deposit on and get another <laughs> snake. But in the long run, 
knowing you because you had been a patron for a while and we'd also taken some um, things through Reptelligence together before, yeah. knowing you, just my gut said a rainbow boa wasn't going to be the right snake that fit your lifestyle. And I really wanted to make sure that you didn't end up with an animal that you were dissatisfied with because that is not the animal's fault. You know, they are who they are because of their genetics and natural history and natural biology. And you can't really make them be something they're not. You know, it's just interesting because all that time I spent researching <laughs> the rainbow boas and everything that, you know, I don't know why I didn't have that conversation. So I really hope people like watch this video and, you know, get to see the importance of asking yourself those questions. I mean, I, I do have one of my Royals doesn't come out a lot. And so I can't imagine like having, you know, a third snake that didn't come out. I mean, I, I just know I would be you know, sad about that because <laughs> I wouldn't want to force it either. I think, you know, maybe if you're a type of person that's just going to open the enclosure and grab them and just do whatever you want with them, you know, maybe you're going to have a different perspective, but that wasn't you know, anything I was interested in. I, I wanted to have this relationship built on trust and mutual, you know, understanding and that level of enjoyment and watching his behavior is just way more important to me than my self gratification of grabbing a snake out of an enclosure and, and holding it. <laughs> I am always satisfied when I work with somebody and help them pick out an animal, whether it's a snake or a horse or a dog, and they're ultimately happy with that decision because that's part of my job as a behaviorist and as a coach and a consultant is to try to help people make wise decisions when they add an animal to their family because I don't want animals rehomed. I don't want people to be displeased with their animal because it's not the animal's fault that they are who they are. And so I really work hard to try to make sure people take the time to make choices that are likely to work out. I'm glad that you were willing to share your experience because hopefully this will help other people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I've, I've seen that in the, in the, dog world where people have not thought it through and it's not a good situation for the person or the dog. I wish you had, you know, ha had the foresight to see that this animal could not be what you wanted it to be. And it's, so I can totally see how I could have put myself in that situation. And then you're just kicking yourself. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, and it's also, you can't make a dachshund pull an Alaskan sled, right? Or you can <laughs> make a marathon runner and have them sumo wrestle or make a sumo wrestler a marathon runner. That's not going to work. And those are physical characteristics that come to mind. But we need to think about that same match or mismatch when it comes to behavior and temperament and our lifestyle versus what the snake or other animal is capable of fitting into. Exactly. Exactly. And I think also for people out there, I mean, if you are going to get into a bigger snake, having them as a baby too, and growing up with them like that, I think it, it makes you just acclimate to, to them. And it's not going to be such a, a, you know, it's not going to be a big deal when they do reach their full size. But you're also training him and establishing clear contingencies with him and you're establishing a form of communication with him. So as he's a bigger snake, miscommunication and accidents are less likely to happen. Right, right. I couldn't imagine having a, a, a retic without doing target training. Like I can't even fathom it. So I'm very grateful <laughs> to Lori <laughs> for all of her guidance in that. Thank you again for spending the time with me this evening to do this interview. We're going to wrap up. I hope that this helps other people. I have a snake that actually wants out right now. So yeah. you have another aspect to your life that's not reptiles, though. You have a fine art business. So if people want to locate your art or contact you about making them a training target, how would they find you? I do have a website. Just my name. It's DanielleAnnis.com. And it's, it's my fine art is on there. I, I haven't put newer stuff on there. I need to update it. But um, 
And I don't have my targets on there, but if you're interested in the targets or seeing what they look like, you, know, you can message me through Facebook or email me. And I am going to be starting to make other things for enclosures. I am going to be making water dishes that are very organic and natural looking. So that's something I'm going to put my sculpting and artistic prowess into and maybe do some hides and stuff like that. But um, I'm starting with the water dishes and we'll see what happens from there. You need so to when those get out there, I'll post them. I want a water dish hide. A That's, water dish hide. I already have it in my brain and how it's going to work. That sounds great. Well, thank you again so much, Danielle. And I will talk with you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. <laughs>
Get some help if you think that you need to talk your decision through with somebody and don't hesitate to contact me.